So what I'm going to be talking about next is a premix charge spotting magnetic Basically, I want to review some of the details of modeling the very complicated engines that you see. The combustion process is very complicated. So if I look at the spark ignition engine, as I mentioned, we start out with the spark, which is nice and limited. Please get a front of the game flying. Do you have any questions? No, cool. What's this part? Uh, it's 1-1. Really? Will they do it? Yeah. Oh my god, yes. Okay. The flame is a turbulent flame, right? And the way we describe it, as I discussed, is through the use of the G equation, which accounts for both lamina and turbulent flame. Uh, the turbulent flame speed I mentioned to you really depends on the geometry of the device. The lamina incorporates fuel effects. And this is used for the primary heat release of the uh, The other thing that we do is So when a flame reaches close to a surface, the heat transfer uh, to the walls takes away combustion energy and arrests the reaction. So it's called flame quench. Behind the flame, we have post-flame chemistry that's important. Uh, depending on the combustion strategy, you might have additional CO oxidation or hydrogen-oxygen reactions occurring behind the flame. And uh, eventually, this is the material that's going to be exhausted. So if we are interested in pollutant formation, as we were talking about at the beginning of the, at the end of the last uh, session, we need to track what's happening to the species behind the flame as well. And then there's the possibility of knocking combustion. So here we have combustion occurring before the flame has reached this location due to auto-ignition, or kind of like HCCI. But this is very undesirable in many cases because it can lead to very uh, high pressure rise rates in the combustion chamber. So what is a turbulent flame? So Professor Law has this uh, slide that I borrowed from him that uh, shows a picture of a propagating turbulent flame. And if you take a look at the structure of the flame over many realizations, you see it's an incredibly complicated looking surface. And if you break it down, what you see is essentially it's a surface that's propagating at the turbulent flame speed. But within that surface are laminar flames, little laminar flamelets, uh, each of which contributes to the combustion process and increases the area of this turbulent flame front drastically. You can see the, these little wrinkles add up to a large amount of area. So due to the increased surface area, turbulent flame uh, is a brush, a brush of these uh, laminar flamelets, propagates at an enhanced velocity that's really dependent on how much, how many uh, little flamelets contribute to the, the area over which combustion takes place. OK, so let's look a little bit more about laminar flame speeds. A laminar flame, as I mentioned to you before from the Maillard Le Chatelier theory, uh, is a uh, balance between reaction and diffusion. So diffusion would be our uh, turbulent, or uh, if it's a turbulent flame, turbulent diffusivity. And this term here is, the, is representative of the reaction the rate of change of some species mass fraction that's important. And if you take a look at the governing equations, you can simplify them down to an equation for the mass fraction that involves the evolution of mass fraction, a diffusivity term, a diffusion term, and then a mass rate of reaction term. And then, of course, uh, once you have that calculated, you can then also calculate the uh, heat release. So it's kind of interesting to consider a, a simplified version of a reaction diffusion system uh, where we use that same non-dimensional variable that I spoke about for the ordinary differential equation, but now we have a diffusion term as well. Uh, so this is called a reaction diffusion equation. Uh, T is time, X is space, so here's X down here, and uh, we're going to be predicting a propagating flame that moves as a function of time. And the reaction source term, F of U, uh, in this case, we'll choose the same reaction source term that we had when we looked at the ordinary differential equation. It has a beta, which is the magnitude of the reaction uh, source term, and it goes to zero when uh, the 
uh, temperature is equal to the unburnt temperature, and it goes to 1 when the temperature is the burnt temperature, which again brings the source term to 0. It turns out that there, for this particular choice, of, uh, which is a reasonable shape reaction uh, source term, uh, that one can find a traveling wave solution. And I describe that in a paper over here. Uh, this wave travels at a speed s, uh, at a constant speed s, that is determined by the uh, diffusivity and the reaction rate. And this term s here is the diffusivity times the magnitude of the reaction rate divided by a constant. Exactly what Millard and Le Chatelier showed from elementary uh, order of magnitude estimates. And the thickness of the flame is just the diffusivity divided by the flame speed within a constant, your choice of constant here. Um, and it turns out that the laminar flame thickness in practical laminar flames is extremely thin, as I'll show you in the next slide. But what, what is important is to understand that these equations admit a traveling wave solution. And what is needed is the diffusivity and a measure of the reaction rate, or the mass rate of consumption of species. Uh, this is how a propagating flame is described mathematically. So uh, at the Engine Research Center, my colleague, uh, Professor Gandhi, uh, has made some measurements of length scales in an actual engine. Uh, here's crank scale, a uh, crank angle, rather. And here's the bachelor scale, uh, the, the couple of scales of turbulence that you're interested in. For uh, momentum, it's Kalmogorov. For species mixing, it's the bachelor scale. And the bachelor scale basically scales with the integral length scale of turbulence, the large scale eddies, divided by the Reynolds number to the 3 quarters power. So it's t typically a pretty small length scale. And it's the length scale of interest when discussing uh, the effect of turbulence on uh, flame propagation. The laminar flame uh, thickness, as I showed you before, is the diffusivity. Here, this is thermal diffusivity, divided by the flame speed. And the laminar flame, for the case that he was looking at, was uh, 20 microns in thickness. So in order to actually resolve a laminar flame, like I'm showing you here, it's only 20 microns thick, you need at least five grid points across here. So that would be a grid size of about four microns in order to actually solve for a laminar flame. So if I go back to this picture, that means that for each of these little laminar flames here, I have to have four grid points or five grid points, four microns each. You can see that to predict a, lam a turbulent flame is going to be an impossibility in, in CFD uh, codes. Um, you can also see that if you look at uh, Norbert Peters' combustion regime diagram here, uh, this line that you see here, uh, it's, a, it's a plot of the length scales of turbulence divided by the laminar flame thickness. Here's the turbulence uh, intensity or the square root of the turbulence kinetic energy divided by the laminar flame velocity. Here's the Kolmogorov scale equal to the uh, laminar flame thickness. If you look at engines, it turns out that they really fit into this regime right here. So you basically have to resolve down to the level of the laminar flame thickness at least, or even be below that, in order to resolve uh, engine flames. The conclusion is, it is not possible to resolve a turbulent flame on a practical engine simulation grid. And this is one of the most difficult aspects of engine uh, combustion, particularly for spark ignited engines, that in my opinion makes them way more complicated than some of the other combustion regimes, like homogeneous charge compression ignition. All you have to worry about is chemistry. Here you have to worry about turbulence and chemistry. So how do you model turbulent flames? Well, <coughs> uh, Norbert Peters uh, did some analysis where he showed, um, with certain assumptions, that the turbulent flame speed uh, is equal to 1 times a term here that's uh, uh, initially 0, so let's neglect that for a minute. The turbulent flame speed is equal to uh, the laminar flame speed times a stretch factor. The stretch factor depends on the turbulence intensity, the laminar flame thickness, uh, the 
radius of the developing flame kernel, and other parameters. But you can think of it as being close to one initially uh, in the uh, combustion process. These other terms account for what happens a little later. So there's a term called a progress term in our models that has a constant here, CM2. That is zero when time equals the time of ignition. Uh, there's a time scale associated with this term. That's the turbulence time scale. And essentially, it shows the development of the initial flame uh, kernel. The way we model that in practice is with what we call the discrete particle initial ignition kernel, where because the ignition process is occurring sub-grid scale, our grids are millimeters by millimeter by millimeter, and the ignition process can occur at length scales much shorter than that, we use particles uh, that we allow to move at a velocity determined by the uh, formulas you see here uh, until the uh, size of this kernel reaches a critical value, uh, which depends on the turbulence uh, length scale. Uh, and once that is reached, we then switch to what's called the G equation, which I'll discuss in a second. But if you go back to the equation up above here, which looks pretty complicated, we've discussed the progress term. Here we have another term that includes the turbulent uh, uh, fluctuation velocities. And that's kind of where you start to see the influence of turbulence directly on the turbulent flame speed. Um, and there's also the length scales of the turbulence compared to the laminar flame thickness. Uh, it's, there's a quadratic term over here. So it's a very complicated equation that Norbert uh, uh, derived. Uh, but nevertheless, we found it actually gives fairly good results. Uh, this tr transition criterion also involves another constant, CM1 here. So we say that when this flame kernel has grown to a size comparable to the turbulent length scale times some constant, we switch to the G equation. The G equation is a level set equation uh, that is equal, where G is equal to zero is the flame location. And we solve this partial differential equation, which includes convective terms on a moving grid here. So that's why there's this uh, vertex velocity. Uh, the turbulent flame speed is part of this. This is what drives the propagation of the G equation. Uh, the density ratio between the unburnt and the, and the uh, uh, burnt um, uh, mixture. And then a term that involves the curvature of the flame front. Again, the turbulent diffusivity appears here. So this is the G equation. It's also something that Norbert Peters had proposed uh, for other applications as well. So you need the laminar flame speed. Well, the laminar flame speed uh, is, again, quite a complicated uh, parameter that depends on the fuel choice. So for instance, if we look just at the paraffins, methane is extremely unreactive. Unre uh, and it has a very low flame speed compared to the next hydrocarbon up in the chain, ethane. And everything else falls in between. So uh, if we know the fuel type, we can estimate the flame speed. Uh, if a fuel is made up of various components, then we'll have to kind of blend those flame speeds to get an estimate of what the actual laminar flame speed would be for that uh, mixture. Uh, we have data for olefins, aromatics, uh, and oxygenates. It's really interesting that methane is down here and methanol is up here. You know, it just shows how the, the, the oxygen here steals electrons away from the C, COH bond here, making it much more reactive than just the CH bond from methane. That reactivity then shows up with, it's much easier to propagate a fast flame through methanol. Anyway, so this is an input then to the G equation model. We need the laminar flame speed uh, over here. <coughs> Actually, that should also be laminar flame speed there. Um, we also need the flame thickness. Uh, and you can see these are parameters that are fed into the turbulent flame speed correlation. So this just shows a, an application of the G equation uh, to solve a spark ignition engine. Problem. We start out with our DPIC model, the discrete particle ignition model, that sets off the combustion process. We switch to the G equation when it reaches a certain size. Uh, and here we propagate this front with the G model. 
Uh, if you look at what the G field looks like, there will be regions where G is greater than zero. That corresponds to the region behind the flame. That's the burnt flame, re uh, burnt gas region. The unburnt gas is ahead of that where G is less than zero. And uh, here's our marker, if you like, for the flame front location. The good thing about the G equation is you can use it also for partially premixed flames, like you might find in a, in a direct injection engine. Because here, here at stoichiometric mixtures, the G equation will give you um, uh, the fastest flame speed or close to it because of the stoichiometric mixture. Uh, and the products of combustion behind that would be the combustion products for more or less complete combustion. But you can also operate with rich mixtures and lean mixtures. Of course, the difference would be the flame speed, the laminar flame speed would be slower for each of those regimes. So the front would then move at slower rates. It's, of course, in this case, moving to the left. And you might even have products of combustion diffusing back and reacting behind the flame uh, in the case of uh, direct injection engine where you have stratified mixtures. The only thing that matters from the point of view of flame propagation is the location of the G equals zero surface. All of this other stuff going on behind the flame is handled with the, with the well-stirred reactor concept in each uh, computational cell. So to validate this model, we uh, had some uh, work we did with Ford. We ha they had a, a port fuel in injected gasoline engine. Um, so actually the injector was in, in one of the ports here. Uh, we had a certain PRF mechanism to model the fuels. Uh, those two model constants I mentioned, and then the engine itself had a compression ratio of 12 to 1, speed 1500 RPM. And we looked at combustion at different spark timings, going from 44 degrees before top to send it to 32 degrees. Uh, this was a partially uh, thr throttled operation at 65 kPa manifold air pressure. So this just shows an example of our numerical results. The engine is quite a complicated geometry, pent roof geometry. You can see the valves here and the shape of the combustion chamber surface. Uh, it had a flat piston. Uh, the surface that you see here is just after the spark. So this, this case was spark uh, timing 40 degrees before top dead center, and we're looking at 20 degrees minus after, so plus before. Um, so this is just uh, 20 degrees after the initiation of the spark event. And this kernel then grows and propag uh, turns into a propagating flame. So here's uh, the situation at 5 degrees before top dead center, 10 degrees after top dead center, and 20 degrees after top dead center. The flame propagates out and eventually quenches at the surfaces. This is the evolution then of the G surface. I think I can show a movie of that. So here this gives you a feel for the combustion process. Now you'll notice that uh, in the movie I left uh, the ignition kernel behind just so you could see where the transition occurred between the, ignition, the end of the ignition kernel development and the propagating flame. <coughs> So to check on the performance of that model, here are comparisons between the experimentally measured cylinder pressure versus crank angle for the various, um, excuse me, the various uh, spark timings. This is port fuel injection, in other words, homogeneous charge. Uh, here we go, from minus 44 to minus 32. And you can see very good agreement uh, over this range of uh, spark timings. Of course, this model is now used um, widely um, also at Ford for modeling port fuel injection um, cases. So it's kind of interesting to explore the combustion in a little bit more detail. We used the G equation, and we were able to match the experimental pressure pretty nicely uh, for this particular combustion process. What if instead of using the G equation, we had said in each computational cell, we're going to use just the assumption of a well-stirred reactor and let the reactions control the combustion rate? 
Well, if you do that, what you find is, okay, we have ignition, we transition from the kernel to the G equation. If the G equation is applied, we get this result. But in the other case, we find we just don't get good combustion at all. In other words, flame propagation is absolutely required in order to match spark ignition engine combustion. Now, in this plot on the right, I'm showing a direct injection mode where the fuel was di directly injected into the combustion chamber relatively late in the compression stroke. So it's more like a diesel engine, if you like. And now we actually get reasonable results if we just assume a well-stirred reactor in each computational cell, but still not as good as with the G equation. So when, the message that I'm trying to portray here is that the Maillard Le Chatelier propagating wave is the mechanism of combustion in a homogeneous charged spark ignition engine. And unless your model reproduces something that looks like this, namely the, the flame speed is proportional to diffusivity due to turbulence and a rate of reaction due to chemistry, you're just not going to be able to match experimental results. Which is unfortunate because it makes the model much more complicated to have to account for both chemistry and uh, turbulent uh, processes. So this is summarized in this plot here. Auto-ignition chemistry alone is not sufficient to properly model uh, flame propagation. The turbulence enhancing effect on flame propagation speeds in SI engines cannot be neglected. And you can see that from just looking at these pictures here. With kinetically controlled combustion, you can see very slow flame development, whereas with a flame propagation model, you, you match the experiment, you see much faster flame propagation. Okay, so one of the other, and this deals with the flame propagation part of things, but the other thing that's of interest these days for uh, both diesel and uh, gasoline engines is particulates. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about particulates. Uh, there's a new challenge, namely that particulates uh, are now not only restricted in terms of the mass that you produce in the exhaust, but also the number of particles. And this occurs for both gasoline engines and for diesel engines. And in fact, the Euro 6 and the California LEV 3 uh, regulations uh, specify the amount of mass in milligram per kilogram, uh, sorry, per milligram per kilometer uh, of particulates, and also the number of particulates. Okay, so particulates. This is a plot here of the probability, if you like, of uh, a certain particle size. Uh, it's a log plot down here. And just to give you a feel for particulates, uh, the scale up here shows that regulated emissions are around 2.5 micron. So around the, this region over here, same size as red blood cells. So uh, we're talking about uh, small quantities here. If you take a look at this plot, you'll see that particulates are actually uh, spanning a wide range of sizes in an actual combustion process. The dotted line shows mass weighting. So you see this uh, a little peak here that is associated with very small particles in the nuclei mode. And then there's what's called an accumulation mode, and then the coarse mode. And the 2.5 is somewhere around here. Um, if you look at it in the number weighting, you see tremendous number of very, very small particles in the nuclei mode, and then not many in these uh, larger size ranges. As far as the particulate number regulations are concerned, uh, they uh, really kick in around here, uh, around 20 nanometers, or uh, what's that, 0.02 um, micron. So, We've uh, spent quite a bit of time, again, at industries, uh, in following industries' requirements and interest in trying to develop models for soot. And I'm going to talk more about this um, in tomorrow's um, lecture. But I just thought I'd mention to you briefly a little bit about the soot models. Uh, basically, we track species in the uh, chemical kinetics all the way up to uh, pyrene, or C16, at which point we assume that they form soot particles. Uh, 
Uh, we have then surface growth due to acetylene, coagulation of particles. Uh, then we have two oxidation steps through O2 and OH. And then the uh, polyarometric hydrocarbon uh, forming additional uh, contributions to soot. All of this is handled through transport equations. And again, I'm going to show you those in much more detail tomorrow. But I just wanted to show you the outline of this because we've done quite a bit of uh, soot modeling also with um, Ford. And in fact, uh, we have data from them. This is a premix charge SI engine. Uh, the engine itself, again, is a 12 to 1 compression ratio, about 86 millimeter bore. Uh, in this case, the engine speed was 2100 RPM. Uh, it's a pen roof, flat top piston. You see the picture of it over here. Numerical mesh is 70,000 cells. It's a relatively small number, but we've done calculations with much bigger uh, number of cells and seen similar results. Uh, the spark plug is located at the center of the head. It's a homogeneous fuel air mixture. The experiment used an EPA fuel, 28% aromatics. So in our modeling, we used isooctane with 28% toluene using the multi-chem mechanism that I described to you earlier. Uh, the calculations used the ignition model and then the G equation combustion model. And then we tracked the amount of soot produced in the combustion chamber uh, for different cases. And these different cases here all were centered around an equivalence ratio of one, a homogeneous uh, charge engine uh, stoichiometric would be phi equals one. So we looked on the rich side and on the lean side. Uh, this number here just gives the CO ratio of the, of the, of the fuel uh, in the combustion chamber. And we're plotting the amount of in-cylinder soot in grams per kilogram fuel. And as you can see, for the rich side, this purple one here, we get a tremendous amount of predicted in-cylinder soot. Whereas on the lean side, we see some soot, but very little uh, later in time. So by the time you reach about 80 degrees after top dead center, uh, these curves level out. And you can say, well, this is what you might expect to see in the exhaust. Um, if I look at the top dead center time and the combustion chamber, and I'm looking here, the colors represent uh, soot concentration, and the purple here is the propagating flame. You'll see that if I'm on the lean side, <coughs> the blues here represent low soot levels. Uh, I don't see as much soot as if I'm on the rich side, even at top dead center. If I then go to 80 degrees after top dead center, I see quite a different picture because here in the rich side, I see lots of soot, especially near the walls. Uh, this would be in the red region over here. Whereas on the lean side, very little soot uh, in the combustion chamber. So to kind of get a better picture of what's happening, uh, what we did was we looked along a diameter in the combustion chamber at these various times just to see how the flame propagation is influenced influencing soot formation. So this is the result of that. So we're looking along a diameter, and we're looking at top dead center. The plot here with the squares is the in-cylinder temperature, which goes from the unburnt gas temperature of about 750 to 2,500 behind the flame. This is the G equation solution, and G equals zero is where the flame is predicted to be located, right? Uh, so you can see that the temperature increases across the flame, as you might expect. The plot below shows some of the species mass fractions uh, in the uh, region which we can call burnt. You see very small amounts of uh, soot precursor species. This is acetylene and our soot surrogate uh, pyrene. Uh, but nevertheless, you notice that there is soot buildup right in the flame front region here, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, you'll see the uh, acetylene peak is on the uh, burnt gas side of the flame, uh, and uh, it's contributing to the, the process by which soot is formed in the flame. If I now go 
<coughs> to uh, some of the other variables. So for example, I look at oxygen. Ahead of the flame, I, uh, this is a log plot here now, I see lots of oxygen and in the flame itself, let's see, did I put that down? Yeah, here's the extent of the flame. In the uh, burnt gas region behind the flame, the oxygen concentration is very low on the log plot. However, there's a lot of OH behind the flame, and the oxygen and OH are the species that oxidize the soot. So if I look at the soot mass fraction, which is the squares here, I see it increases uh, in the flame front and then is oxidized behind the flame. Uh, here. And it's not symmetric because this isn't a symmetric engine, right? We've got intake flows that are different in the different ports and so on. But it's more or less symmetric. So you can see from this that OH plays a major role in oxidizing soot and that most of the soot is formed basically in the flame region. Uh, if I look at the predicted number density and particle size, I see that uh, in the region behind the flame there's very little soot. Particle size is not really relevant. Uh, but here you see uh, sizes on the order of 100 nanometers predicted uh, in the flame front itself. Uh, if I look now at the situation uh, at the end of combustion, around 80 degrees after top dead center, I find that most of the soot is near the walls. Remember, this is the center line here where the spark plug was. It's an 80 millimeter bore, so the walls are here and here. You see a lot of soot near the walls. Well, why is that? Well, it's cold there, right? And uh, you don't have a lot of OH being formed uh, which is then not available for oxidizing the soot. So that's kind of an interesting finding, a lot of soot near walls. Uh, here's the number density uh, predicted, and then the soot particle diameter. Again, quite large particles near the walls. So these, we then assume, during the exhaust stroke, will get pushed out by the piston into the exhaust. And that's what we're interested in when it comes to combustion uh, soot measurements. So <clears throat> these are measurements from uh, the group at Ford of part particulate size distributions for the different cases here. So we're looking at the size of the particles and their probability or number density per cubic centimeter. Um, and as you can see, for the richest mixture case, we have the largest uh, particles and uh, a, a lot of them. All right, this is a log plot. Uh, and as we lean out the mixture, we see fewer and fewer particles, and especially the larger particles uh, are no longer being formed. And then uh, once we get down to equivalence ratios close to 1 or 1.3 over here, the curves all seem to collapse to a, a, a single curve in this uh, size, the particle size distribution. Um, so that's what was measured. Uh, this is the simulation result. At first sight, you say, well, that's not very good, is it? On the other hand, we do get certain trends. Like, for example, for the very rich mixture, we see the largest particle size uh, and also uh, the largest particles. And if you look at the number density here, this is 1 10 to the 9, that's 1 10 to the 9. The numbers are actually reasonably well predicted. Um, this is for the next uh, equivalence ratio, 1.4. But once we get down to leaner mixtures, the shape of the curve actually looks quite different than the experiment. And this really points out to failure in, in soot modeling, especially for the smaller particles. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, the regulation is concerned with particles greater than about 23 nanometers. So you should really not worry about too much about what happens on the left here. And if you just look to the right of this curve, you could argue, well, that's not a, too bad <laughs> an agreement. But nevertheless, there's room for lots of improvement. As I mentioned, soot particle count, uh, number is a key parameter that is really driving the industry pretty mad now, because how do you change soot particle number and soot particle mass that requires significant changes in the combustion process. 
Um, OK, so the other problem in the spark ignition engine is knocking combustion. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. You have a propagating flame, and it's possible ahead of the flame to have auto-ignition reactions occurring that lead to high pressure rise rates. So we did in some simulations, again uh, with Ford, uh, and we monitored the pressure at various stations in the, in the computational domain uh, on, the, on the head region. Uh, of course, in the experiment, they might have had only one pressure transducer, but we had eight in our numerical calculation. And at each of these uh, locations, we measured the cylinder pressure as a function of crank angle. Measured, we predicted the cylinder pressure as a function of crank angle. And then uh, did a, a Fourier transform, or basically removed the, the low frequency components, and just looked at the fluctuating component of pressure. And as you can see, uh, for this operation point at operating point one here, uh, there was actually a fluctuation in pressure, which shows up in the pressure trace, with a certain peak-to-peak -peak maximum uh, amount of you know, several bar, right? Um, so this indicated that there was a little bit of engine knock. And so we simulate the local pressure. The, the simulated local pressures are filtered with a filter, a bandpass filter, as you might use in the experiment. And the results were then compared with um, results from a very simple wave analysis by Draper many years ago, who looked at the natural frequency of gas in a cylinder and found that the, the uh, different uh, wave propagation modes, these are acoustic waves, depended on the diameter of the cylinder. And you had uh, a variety of different types of modes depending on um, the, the, uh, the geometry. So these are radial modes, and then there are also circumferential modes and so on. And for the engine that we looked at, we could predict the frequencies associated with those modes. So it was of interest to see how they compare with the frequencies of these fluctuations in the pressure. Um, one thing that's also useful for uh, researchers is to define a knock index. Uh, a knock index, which is basically a measure of this peak-to-peak -peak fluctuation over the eight transducers that we had in this case and averaged uh, for the engine. OK, so here are some of the predictions of knocking combustion in spark ignition engines. Now let's look at the bottom set of plots first. So here's the combustion chamber. This white region you see here is because we have a pent roof engine. You can't see through the metal in, when you cut through this plane. So that's basically outside the engine. Here's the spark plug, and you see the flame starting to develop. Uh, the black line is the flame propagating into the unburnt blue flame mixture. Uh, the colors that I'm showing you here are temperatures. So red is the high temperature region. Blue is the low temperature region. And you see that we're actually predicting some combustion ahead of the propagating flame. Uh, and this persists all the way to the end of combustion when the flame reaches the walls of the combustion chamber. So this was the case where we uh, started the ignition 10 degrees before top dead center. If we advanced the spark timing to 25 degrees before top dead center, then we got the top plot here. Again, you see the flame propagating. But now, suddenly, around 30 degrees after the spark, that's five degrees after top dead center, you see very fast combustion occurring way ahead of the black line indicating the G equals zero surface or the flame location. And that's knock. In other words, rapid pressure uh, increase in those regions because of auto ignition. So the factors that affect the knock intensity are the end gas auto-ignition tendency. If I have a, a fuel with a high octane number, I can prevent this uh, auto-ignition ahead of the flame. Uh, also, the time available, so engine speed plays a role here as well. So this plot is kind of fun to look at. It's a, a prediction of the in-cylinder pressure and the temperature variation uh, after the start of knocking. Um, this was done by Jim Wang in my group. And 
it's really amazing to see these waves propagating back and forth. These are pressure waves. They propagate at the speed of sound, basically, through the mixture. Um, and you can also identify the various modes. You can see sloshing combustion back and forth, uh, corresponding to radial modes. And then you can even see circum circumferential modes as this thing rotates around. And then eventually, in the expansion stroke, dies away. So you can imagine, if you have this massive increase in uh, heat release ahead of the flame, generating a local high pressure, that's going to then propagate acoustically across the combustion chamber, leading to oscillating flows. Whoops. Oscillating flows. So I'm just looking at uh, time of 0.2 crank angles apart here and plotting, uh, in this case, the flow velocity. You see tremendous velocities uh, oscillating back and forth across the combustion chamber, set in motion by this uh, pressure release. That has an effect on heat transfer. So if I look at this plot on the right here, I'm looking at energy versus crank angle. This is the fuel energy. So I, I combust and I release this amount of fuel energy. And now I look at the contributions due to heat transfer. If I didn't have NOC, I'd be down here on this light blue line. So heat transfer is a relatively small percentage of the heat release due to combustion. But if I have knocking, and we have two different models here, but if I have knocking, you see this increases significantly, right? So just a mention of what the models look like. One of the things we realized when we looked at the wall heat transfer models, and I'll be talking more about them uh, tomorrow as well, uh, is that standard wall heat transfer model, uh, the law of the wall, really doesn't include the effect of rapid changes in pressure in the combustion chamber, uh, nor due to combustion energy release. So we made some modifications to the wall heat transfer model to account for those, and that's what took us from the blue to the red curve here. Uh, we think this is more accurate depiction of the actual heat release, heat transfer at the walls. Uh, due to this, in the course of this process. So you can see here that when we have knocking combustion, uh, we get heat transfer to the walls that's nearly 40% of the total fuel energy. That's, a, that's an incredible increase in heat loss. So it's, again, something you really want to avoid. Of course, there's an even worse situation, which is called super knock or stochastic pre-ignition or low speed pre-ignition many different names. And super knock has been shown to be a real problem, especially for downsized engines that are turbocharged. So here's a plot of brake mean effect of pressure versus engine speed. Uh, the, the blue dotted lines here show operation uh, with naturally aspirated conditions. You can see fuel efficiency depending on engine um, calibration points. The red lines show operation with turbocharging. Conventional knock is, is basically occurs in the range uh, shown over here. Super knock occurs at low engine speeds and high, highly turbocharged engines, high brake mean effective pressures. What is super knock? Well, here you see for various uh, cycles, so the engine is turning, and we're looking at the pressure as a function of time. Here's one cycle, next cycle, next cycle, and so on. And in this particular case, we reached a certain cycle where suddenly there's a massive increase in pressure. And this happens sometimes even before spark. But what causes this huge increase in pressure? Well, obviously, it's autoignition. It's kind of like HCCI, except we've got a, a, a stoichiometric engine here. So there's a huge amount of fuel that can burn and be ignited and go off with a bang. And you can destroy your engine very easily. In fact, uh, that's one of the main problems for the industry is how to avoid super knock. And then everything looks good, OK. And then you see another one. And then it's very unpredictable, random uh, uh, knock. The results, you can see down here, completely destroyed valves, uh, destroyed pistons, and so on. So it's definitely a totally undesirable uh, operating regime. 
So we've done some uh, simulations to try to predict uh, the kind of press pressure up oscillations that we, you'd see during very violent knock. Uh, and they're shown over here. So you see some uh, simulated pressure versus crank angle. The difference in these different plots here is the time step we use in the numerical simulation. Um, obviously, to be able to resolve these, these uh, detonation waves, essentially, that are traveling across the, the combustion chamber, you need very small time steps. This is a tenth of a microsecond uh, in order to actually resolve these wiggles. You can then do a Fourier analysis on these uh, pressure oscillations and show where the frequency peaks are and then compare them with Draper's model. Uh, Draper's model shows uh, over here the um, frequencies associated with the radial modes, uh, the circumferential mode, the first circumferential mode, here's another radial mode and so on. Uh, and then down below here, hardly visible unfortunately, are the values we got from the uh, spectrum from the calculation. And, you know, they're in the same order anyway, um, and show that we are predicting some of the things that that simple model predicts with regard to resonance structures in the combustion chamber. Okay, so to finish this section, I want to just make a couple of points. One is that autoignition chemistry, which we said was okay for combustion like HCCI, is not sufficient to model the flame propagation process in a homogeneous charge spark ignited engine. The turbulence enhancing effect on the flame propagation speed just cannot be, be neglected. You really have to account for it. And one way to do that that we found to be very useful is through the G equation. Uh, then getting to the particulates, the gasoline particulate emissions originate in the flame. Uh, this wasn't really well understood before the simulations that I showed you today. A lot of people thought that the particulates came behind the flame. So this shows where they originate, and then the fact that they accumulate near the wall was one of the results of this set of simulations. And then finally, for knocking combustion, uh, here we find that in order to resolve the rapid heat release associated with uh, uh, um, pressure waves, even detonation waves, you really do need to uh, exploit very fine numerical resolution in terms of tracking those waves and looking at their effect. And here are the references. So, questions about spark ignited engines. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a lot more about soot uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, but basically, what we uh, say is it's a collection of carbon. And we have a model that tells you uh, where it originated. Yeah. Not for not. You have the pressure transducer at points, and you have pressure fluctuations that are around the combustion chamber. How do you take that measurement? Exactly. Uh, so, for an experimentalist, that's a big problem, right? For calculations, it's wonderful because you have the whole pressure field everywhere. But you would see every time a wave went by at a particular point, you'd see an increase in pressure associated with the pressure field across that wave. So you'd still notice yeah. not. And in fact, I showed you a pressure case that you see wiggles in it. Does the point you choose to measure pressure affect? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it depends on the combustion mode. <coughs> One of my colleagues uh, always jokes, he said, if you put the pressure transducer exactly in the middle of the combustion chamber, you'll never see any knock. <laughs> because the radial modes and the circumference potential modes are all zero, right? That's not the front. So that's the place to put your pressure transducer. <laughs> OK, one more. We know that the laminar can be for pure fuels. If we have a mixture of different fuels, how can we calculate the... Yeah, that's a good question. So we use some sort of a blending uh, in determining what the laminar flame speed is. I believe there are experiments that have been done that show that that's not a bad approach, but I still feel a little uncomfortable with that. 
especially if there's a wide range of diamond pairs used for the different components. I mean, your, your concern is that there are interactions that go right. to the I mean, what is a laminar flame? Okay, we have uh, diffusional processes that send light species like hydrogen atoms and so on ahead into the unburned mixture, which then ignites the fuel by hydrogen extraction reactions or whatever. So different molecules are going to have different propensity to do that, which is going to lead to different flame speeds. It's not obvious that it, there's a linear uh, correlation with the flame speed of that species. So it's a very complicated process. But the good thing is if you look at my plot of flame speeds, you'll see the range is not that large for the hydrocarbons of it. It's more than 50%. So, you know, not too bad in a sense. Why do we have to put off when we have to Time. Okay, so there's a lot of time for the emission to occur and to develop into a detonation. Uh, so that's the other thing. Operator has to be. <laughs> of course, you don't care about friction, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you show uh, the results, so to say the suit is more uh, near the wall uh, to the piston. So, have you seen near the piston guy there's also more soup or not? Yeah, uh, there is. If you take an engine apart and take a look at it, you'll see um, the, you know, the, the pattern of where soup is being formed, and you'll see more near the line uh, or the end of the piston region. Uh, but remember, during the expansion, uh, the uh, uh, exhaust spark, you send that. Um, whatever in the combustion chamber out through the exhaust, and you have a chance to mix it again. So you might see soot everywhere. But you know, you will definitely see a pattern of soot with more soot at the extremities of the combustion chamber. So um, does the decreasing model uh, assume that you have distinct product and reaction loads, or can it also handle like localized product pockets or uh, yeah, so I'm going to show you tomorrow the use of the G equation of diesel combustion. Uh, you can handle um, separate ignition locations, uh, each one growing and merging with other uh, combustion regions. It's, I think, the sensible way to do a uh, CFD modeling of combustion. Because you're tracking the flames, and actually it requires incredible input. You need flame speed, and that's where the flame and flame comes from. Lamb and flame speed, and you need that as well as an input. Yeah, so it's like you're saying, you're not Because you can't model down to the scale, as I said, of a lamb and flame. That's what makes the spark ignition engines so difficult to model. So, just one point following up on the suits on the walls. Like it was interesting to see that because you know one of the mechanisms for suit deposition is through uh, thermal process. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm wondering like how the model was able to capture. So I'll show you tomorrow in our suit model we actually have a term for thermophoretic effects that you can use to predict the amount of suit on the wall. Uh, we have some papers on that. But that, that's a very good effect. I mean, you basically the suit is being driven down the temperature gradient to stick on the wall. So that leads to the subject of engine deposits. And engine deposits are basically you've got a suit that appears on the walls and then it undergoes chemical changes and eventually becomes crimp, right? And that leads then to a thermal barrier, which actually helps engines and because it lowers heat loss. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you want to And that's why you have to run in an engine, you know. Uh, it changes its operating characteristics over time and eventually reaches a steady uh, level of deposits on, on surfaces. So they could, I think, also increase weighting. Uh, they can be porous and that causes trouble because hydrocarbons hide inside these deposits. When Professor um, Calvati is here on Thursday, I asked him that question. When he was at Shell, he worked for 20 years on deposits. He can tell you everything you want to know about deposits. OK, uh, let's meet again at, I think, 4.30, right?